Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. A man named Roy Engel once made a special trip to Washington, D.C. to specifically go and see the Hope Diamond, which is kept in the Smithsonian Institute, where it is on permanent exhibition. The diamond has the place of honor at the head of the Smithsonian's National Gem Collection and is the most visited exhibition at the Smithsonian. It is a 45-carat diamond, and the Hope Diamond is recognized around the world as the most beautiful blue diamond in the world. Upon arriving at the Smithsonian, Mr. Engel says, I stood above it and looked through the bulletproof glass at it. There are no words with which to describe it. He approached one of the four guards in the room in which it is displayed and asked, what is the value of this jewel? The guard answered, no price has been put on it, and it doesn't matter what the value of it is. It will never be sold again. It's priceless. It is our own. It belongs to America. It is ours forever. That diamond has an appropriate name, the Hope Diamond, because hope, the hope we have in Christ, is priceless. There is no value you can place on the hope you and I have in Him. And the hope we have in Christ is our own. It is ours forever. And nothing and no one can ever take it away from us. In Christ we have the hope of eternal life, the hope of the rapture, the hope of our resurrection, and the hope of reunion with our saved loved ones who have passed away. Thus, because of the sure and certain hope we have in Christ, when we grieve at the death of our loved ones, we grieve with hope. 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4 read, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. My father served as the president of Berean Bible Society before me for nearly 30 years. He went home to be with his Savior in the spring of 2016. Like many families, our family is close-knit. My father and mother had 47 wonderful loving years of marriage, and we were all very close to my father. My closeness with my dad was enhanced by working together with him in the ministry for 20 years here at Brian Bible Society. At a BBS board of directors meeting following my father's passing, the board went to dinner together. We made reservations at a restaurant that the board had eaten at for the previous 20 years. The waitress, who worked there for many years, paused and looked at all of us sitting around the table and said, one of you is missing, and she was speaking of my father. Our family feels that constantly. One of us is missing, and we miss him, and we feel that loss every day. Sorrow is a journey and a shadowy val valley that you walk through, but we never walk through it alone. In episode 114 of Transformed by Grace, I shared a story about a woman talking to her mother about her life and how things were very diff difficult for her at the time. To comfort her, her mother used the illustration of a carrot, an egg, and coffee beans. She filled three pots with water, put a carrot in one, an egg in one, and coffee beans in the third pot. But then she put them on the stove, turned the stove on, let them sit till the water was boiling. Afterwards, she fished out the carrot and put it in a bowl pulled the egg out and put it in a bowl, and ladled the coffee and put it in a bowl. Then she taught her daughter how the same adversity of the boiling hot water had three different effects on those three different items. The carrot went in strong and hard, but after it was subjected to the boiling water, it softened and became weak. The egg went in fragile, but the boiling water hardened it, and it became hard-boiled. 
the water with the coffee beans became a good cup, good tasting cup of coffee, and it changed the water. Then she asked her daughter regarding the difficulty, which, which are you? Are you the carrot that seems strong, but the adversity causes you to be without strength? Are you the egg that starts with a malleable heart, but changes with the heat, and you become hardened as a result of it? Or are you the coffee bean? And when things get difficult, the bean releases its fragrance, fragrance and flavor and changes the situation around you. Now, what I'd like to tell you is that after my father passed away, that I was the coffee bean. But when it happened, I found that I was the carrot. I thought I was strong. I had grown deeper in my faith over the years. I've preached many times about being strong in the Lord in times of suffering. But the powerful pain and adversity of grieving my dad's death overwhelmed me. And it caused me to wilt and lose strength. I had never felt so weak as in the days and weeks after my dad passed away. I felt like life was spinning out of control, like I had control of absolutely nothing. And I learned how raw emotions can become. After my father's burial and conducting his service, my family was sitting in the living room of my parents' home. There's a wall of bookshelves there, and I was sitting next to it. I pulled down Charles Swindoll's book, Embraced by the Spirit, and began reading. He began the book with a story of a time when he was 10 years old and his father had almost passed away. His dad gave him a talk about how he wanted him to live after he died, and that, of course, caught my attention. I kept reading, and Charles Swindoll wrote this. In John 13 to 17, Christ tells the disciples, I'm going away. They sat paralyzed, riveted to that statement. They were in shock. They couldn't cope with the news of his departure, just as I couldn't, as a little boy, cope with the possibility that my dad would be gone by morning. Sorrow filled their hearts, John 16, 6 says of the disciples. The Greek word for sorrow means grief, the devastating pain that accompanies the loss of someone we love. Jesus understood all that they were experiencing. He saw that grief and fear had gripped them. We all want very much to give the impression that we can handle anything that comes. We want to appear secure even when we feel very insecure. The big lie is we can handle everything. The truth is, deep down within each of us, we long to be kept. We ache to be held securely. When some earthquake takes that security from us, the moorings of our foundation shift. It happens when we face the possibility of a terminal illness or the death of a loved one. The imminence of danger or separation brings about feelings of desperate insecurity. That's what happened with the disciples. But Christ promised in John 14, 18, I will not leave you orphans. Christ was leaving them permanently. And though they, they were adults, the sting of his departure left them feeling orphaned. Pastor Swindoll continued, My father's departure from this life in 1980 marked a passage in my life after which things would never be quite the same. No more visits, no more phone calls. No more opportunities to sit and talk through something and to have him listen and respond. In a strange way, since that day, there are occasions I feel orphaned. I still miss being able to see my father, to hear his voice, to watch him respond. That was how the disciples felt. No more meals together, no more discussions beside the sea, no more quiet talks around the fire at night, no more shared laughter or tears or watching him handle some thorny situation orphaned. I love Jesus' compassion for them in that moment. He carefully chose his words. I won't leave you orphaned. I have a solution. The answer Jesus gave them was the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm a firm believer in the providence of God. I don't think it was a coincidence that I picked up that book at that moment on that day. At that moment, I felt very insecure. My foundation had shifted. I felt orphaned. 
And I know the Lord was pointing me to my relationship with Him through the Holy Spirit as the place I needed to turn to for comfort and security in life. We'll be returning to the program in just a minute. But first, we'd like to take this time to thank you, our partners, for making these programs possible. If you would like to access our library of helpful Bible study tools, go to BereanBibleSociety.org. Grieving with Hope, A Personal Journey Through Grief is a 38-page booklet written by Pastor Kevin J. Sadler. Pastor Kevin Sadler offers practical advice and observations based on his journey through grief. The booklet contains sermons he gave in the weeks after his father went home to be with the Lord. In those trying days, he was encouraged and strengthened by the Word, which he now shares in booklet form so that others may be comforted. To order your copy, contact the Berean Bible Society for pricing and availability at 262-255-4750 or visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. To receive our free full-color 32-page monthly magazine, The Berean Searchlight, call 262-255-4750 or subscribe online at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. Thank you again for your generous gifts. And now, back to the teaching with Pastor Kevin. Romans 15.4 reads, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. The Scriptures give comfort. I believe they are to be our primary source of comfort in times of sorrow and grief. Romans 15.4 here speaks of the comfort of the Scriptures, and that by our patient learning of it, we might have hope. The Spirit makes us strong by His Word, and He comforts and gives us true hope by it. Scripture memory is very and vitally important in life. As I sat there staring out a window in the hospital, dazed and overwhelmed by what was happening during my, la my father's last days, this may shock you coming from a pastor, but my desire wasn't to grab a Bible. Instead, it was to run to a Bible passage already in my mind and heart. I pondered verses I knew and had memorized and that were important to me. Isaiah 40, 31 and 2 Corinthians 12, 9 gave me immense comfort in those days. I would often quote Psalm 46, 1 in my mind, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And Psalm 121, 1 and 2, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. These verses that I had hidden in my heart brought comfort and strength to me in those hard moments and during the time of sorrow that followed. I was thankful that I had these verses as a part of me and that they were hidden in my heart at that time. And I'm grateful that my parents raised me in church where Scripture memory was prioritized for young people because that's when those verses were embedded into my heart. I learned many practical things during my journey through grief, and I found that in grief you have irrational thoughts and actions. I grew a beard during that time. My beard was irrational, but I found comfort in it. They were unable to shave my dad in the hospital because he was on such a high and powerful dosage of blood thinners, and also because he had so many tubes on and around his face, so he grew a beard. It may not make any sense now, but it gave me comfort back then. Another irrational thing is that little triggers bring forth big emotions, and they come out of nowhere. For example, I felt real heartache just driving past McDonald's because my dad loved McDonald's coffee and Big Macs. I was preparing a sermon not long after my dad's passing. I had a Bible question, and the quick thought to ask my dad, followed by the just as quick realization that I couldn't, caused me to break down. Those were little things 
but they brought that big emotion and they were heartbreaking. Jealousy is another irrational feeling I had. Hearing of someone still living that was born before 1948, I would have feelings of jealousy, wishing dad had lived longer like that. At that time, I heard of someone who passed away at the age of 70, and my first thought was, what well, I wouldn't give for my dad to have lived until age 70 and have had three more years with him. I found that anger is not wrong in grief, and neither are tears. Mary and Martha were upset when the Lord did not come in time to save Lazarus from dying. John 11, 20 and 21 says, Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. And then in that account, as we remember, Christ himself wept at the death of Lazarus, though he knew he was going to raise him. In his humanity, though, Christ wept at the sorrow and grief that death brings to mankind. So it's not wrong when we weep, weep because even Jesus wept at the death of a loved one. And we have a Savior who is sympathetic with us in our tears and in our grief. Anger is not wrong. Tears are not wrong. And I believe asking why is not wrong. Like Job, you find yourself questioning the Lord. Lord, this doesn't make any sense. Why? Lord, this feels like an injustice. You think of all the plans, the things yet to be done. You can't understand why the Lord would allow it. My dad had so much that he was planning on doing, yet he had commentaries on Revelation he was writing and still finishing at the time. He was planning to work alongside me and training me for the presidency of Brain Bible Society. He had plans to travel with my mom. They wanted to grow old together. And you wonder and you ask why. Even if you don't voice it, you think it. But then you gather yourself. You take stock of God and who He is. You know God is too wise to make a mistake, so you trust Him. We are called to trust Him always, even when things hurt, even when things don't make any sense in life. When God spoke to Job, after all his why questions, God never answered his questions. And God also didn't correct Job for doing so. He just responded with his questions. And he showed Job his majesty his greatness, and his sovereignty. So we are to trust verses like Ecclesiastes 3.11. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he hath set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. That verse says that no man can find out or will ever fully understand the work that God does from beginning to end. To end. So you realize that why is okay to ask, but also, I don't know is a good answer. And asking God why doesn't make God angry with you. It doesn't grieve God. It isn't ungodly. It isn't sinful to do so. It's being honest with God. It's being real with God. Like He wants each of us to be in our personal relationship with Him. It's been said, well, that grief is an, an, is an emotional process, not a logical or linear one, which means that on some days it makes no sense at all. We should never judge anyone who is grieving for the things they say or ask. Just let them say what they say and don't correct it at that time. If they ask you a question, respond, but say very little. Simple things and statements mean the most. People saying, I'm praying for your mom, or I'm praying for you, that meant a lot. Or, I'm here if you need anything. Simple questions, like, can I do anything to help you? Listening with focus, caring about what's being said, little acts of kindness, 
like giving food or groceries, those were all very meaningful because you need genuine warmth and care. I found comfort also in talking to those who have been through what I was going through. What it comes down to is be sensitive. Everyone grieves differently. Everyone grieves on their own timetable. Some of these things may be true, true of you and your experience. Some of it may not. But that's because it's different for everyone. Joseph Bailey and his wife Mary Lou lost three sons. One at 18 days after surgery. Another at five years with leukemia. The third at age 18 after a sledding accident. So when Joe Bailey writes about death and grieving, people listen. Mr. Bailey says that one of the best contributions we can make to a person going through intense suffering and loss is our presence without words, not even verses of Scripture. He says, don't try to prove anything to a mourner. An arm about the shoulder, a firm grip of the hand. These are the proofs grief needs, not logical reasoning. I was sitting torn by grief at the death of my child. Someone came and talked to me of God's dealings, of why it happened, of hope beyond the grave. He talked constantly. He said things I knew were true. I was unmoved, except to wish that he'd just go away. He finally did. Another came, sat beside me. He didn't talk. He didn't ask leading questions. He just sat beside me for an hour or more, listened when I said something, answered briefly, prayed simply and quickly, and left. I was moved. I was comforted. I hated to see him go. That is what we need when we are in the grips of despair and grief. No words, no lecture, no explanation, just presence. The presence of Christ through another. The one thing Job's friends did right when he was in mourning for his children's deaths was that they sat down with him upon the ground seven days and seven nights, and none spake a word unto him, for they saw that his grief was very great. When these friends opened their mouths, that's when the problem started. Grief takes time. It isn't something where you snap your fingers and tomorrow you wake up and you feel better. You don't feel better in a day. There will always be a hole in my life. People like for you to move forward, but I found I think it's because they want to move forward or they feel awkward not knowing how to act or what to say when you continue to hurt over a longer period of time than they expect. Moving forward is a painful thought during times of mourning. And as one brother in Christ told me, you don't move forward, you move through sorrow. Psalm 30 verse 5 says, Weeping may endure for a night, but the joy cometh in the morning. The length of the night for weeping, mourning, and grieving is different for everyone. The morning does come in time. But it takes time to journey through that fog of grief to the point that you can see and think more clearly and experience that joy in the morning of reaching for our hope and knowing that you have a blessed reunion coming one day. Another brother told me at that time, you are now separated from your father, but every day you are moving toward him, toward reuniting with him. This thought, along with the truth that every day I could be reunited with my father at the rapture of the church. Those thoughts, those truths are very comforting. Revelation 14, verse 13 reads, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Henry Van Dyke writes, I am standing upon the seashore. A ship at my side spreads her white sails to the morning breeze and starts for the blue ocean. She is an object of beauty and strength. I stand and watch her until at length 
she hangs like a speck of white cloud just where the sea and sky come to mingle with each other. Then someone at my side says, there, she's gone. Gone where? Gone from my sight, that is all. She is just as large in mast and hall as she was when she left my side. Her diminished size is in me, not in her. And just at the moment when someone at my side says, there she is gone, there are other eyes watching her coming and other voices ready to take up the glad shout, here she comes. Revelation 14, 13 is a view of death from the other side, the here she comes side. Viewed from our vantage point, death truly is an enemy and brings with it sorrow, pain, and tears. It's good to hate death because it's an enemy, because it cuts us off and robs us of those who are dear to us, and it separates us from them. But from heaven's vantage point, death is altogether different. Revelation 14, 13 calls those who die in the Lord blessed. And as our apostle Paul says, to be with Christ is gain and far better. Death is a doorway to blessing in heaven. Those who die in the Lord have the blessing of meeting Christ in heaven and being in His presence continually and also being with all the saints in glory. They have the blessing of being in a place of perfect peace, righteousness, and joy. My dad's final words to our family were, see you on the other side. He said those words in light of the surgery he was being taken to at that moment. But we all knew what those words could mean. And so now I think about that from time to time, knowing that I will see my father on the other side. We grieve with hope, knowing that believers who are absent from the body are present with the Lord, and that someday we will be with our believing loved ones again on the other side to experience the same joys that they are currently experiencing with Christ in heaven. And we grieve with hope knowing that every single day the Lord could return to catch all the church, the body of Christ up to be with him at the rapture. And at that great event, he will reunite us with those who have gone home before us. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society, P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, may you be transformed by God's grace.